Manchester United have just bought Casemiro from Real Madrid for a fee of £60 million that could rise to £70 million. He'll be on a four-year contract and it could be extended to five years. The question is, what are Manchester United getting from Casemiro that justifies such a huge outlay of money? Now, Casemiro is usually labelled a defensive midfielder, and if you look at his data, it's not particularly hard to see why. On the board in front of me, we've got his pizza chart from Smarter Scout, and as you can see, he just crushes all of the defensive metrics there. So, very good at ball recoveries and interception. He disrupts opposition moves really well. He's an intense defender, and he's very good in the air as well. But he's not just good defensively, he offers a lot in possession as well. So we can see ball retention really high here, link up play volume high too, and progressive passing as well. Maybe not so much on the, the carry and dribble volume, but he is offering stuff in possession. But it's not just in terms of possession that he's offering value. He's also offering value in terms of attacking too. So over in the blue corner here, we can see that he's actually generating XG for his teammates through creative actions, also through ball progression as well. And it's not just simply for others that he's generating that value. He's also getting into the box himself and having a number of shots too. So there's a well-rounded player in Casemiro. So let's have a look at how he'll fit into the Manchester United side. Manchester United play in a 4-2-3-1 out of possession. And that means then that they have these two midfielders here who are responsible for defensive work. But in possession, it's no longer the case that managers keep their out of possession structure the same. Eric Ten Hag only wants to have one player in here because having two players in here is a bit of a waste of personnel. So what we see with Eric Ten Hag teams is that the best on-ball player will drop into a single pivot, so they're going to be helping out with the build-up, and the other defensive player, Fred in this case, will be pushing forward and trying to get into these sorts of areas on the side that he's on. So Manchester United will have this front five and then this back five in terms of the build-up. So with Casemiro being one of the defensive players out of possession, the big question is which one of these two positions is he going to play? Is he going to play the deeper ball playing position or is he going to be playing the slightly higher eight advanced position? Now these build-up moments have been causing Manchester United some problems. So if Casemiro could offer value there, then he'll be very useful. So in possession, what Manchester United are going to try and do is build up from the back and move the ball down the field. Now, a build-up pattern that we saw against Brentford last week was this. So from the goal kick, Martinez is playing the ball to De Gea. De Gea is looking for this pass into Eriksen, who's the pivot player. Eriksen is going to play a bounce pass, a wall pass, an immediate pass to Maguire. And then Maguire has the option of either playing it to Dallo or he can carry the ball forward here. So you're then in a situation where you've got through that first phase of possession and you would hope to be able to move the ball down the field. Now, as we know, Brentford caused a certain amount of problem here because they went man for man. So when Martinez plays the ball to De Gea, the idea is that this striker is going to drop in and cause problems for De Gea, make him rush his play and try and cause some sorts of disruptions in this build-up pattern. And obviously we know that that happened with the goal itself, the second goal. So if we're going to play Casemiro in this position then as the deeper ball-lying player, then he has to be really good in these moments where the ball is coming to his feet and he's able to move it out of his feet and, and play back to goal, as it were. And Casemiro, it could be argued, is not the best in those situations. We know that Casemiro, whenever he's played for Real Madrid, often doesn't play as a single pivot, so you'll often get Tony Kroos, his partner, dropping in as well or helping out in these build-up moments. And sometimes, if it's really difficult, they'll sometimes have Luka Modric dropping out to help out as well. So it may be the case that Casemiro isn't best suited to play that deeper pivot line player, in which case it would make sense that he would fit better as this second eight here and maybe Manchester United would stick with someone like Eriksen who is good on the ball in those situations. Now, as we've already said, Casemiro offers a lot on the ball. He's a very good progressive passer. He likes to play these nice switch passes from one side of the field to the other. He can play into the channels and he can also um, generate a lot of value through getting to the edge of the box. He's a really good box arriver and he will be able to generate chances in that way as well. So in terms of the build-up phase, Casemiro is going to offer something to Manchester United, but rather than what a lot of people might think he might offer, I suspect that he will be used further up the field, he'll be kept out of the way of the build-up, and so he might not necessarily have as big an impact as people expect in the build-up phase. But an area where I think Casemiro will have a really big impact is in the out-of-possession phase. Now, one of the things that we've seen Manchester United do quite badly since Eric Ten Hag came in is defensive transition. That is, moving from a position where Manchester United are attacking to a position where the opposition are attacking and Manchester United leaving too much space, the opposition being able to exploit that and scoring goals. And this is an area where I think Casemiro will offer a lot. 
Now let's just have a look at two moments where Manchester United have had these problems in defensive transition. The first one is the last goal that was scored by Brentford against them. So again, this is a defensive transition moment. So what we're seeing is a lot of Manchester United players in the box, the ball in the box as well and Manchester United in this sort of defensive situation here. Now the ball drops out to Matthias Jensen in this sort of area, and Matthias Jensen can see Ivan Tony up the field here. Now Ivan Tony is being marked by Eriksen and Maguire, and what's gonna happen is Jensen is gonna play this ball into the channel here for Tony to run onto. Now there's another Brentford player over here in Brian and Bemo. What happens is Matthias Jensen plays this ball, but just before he plays it, Maguire steps up a little bit, and that means that he can't track the run of Tony. So when the ball arrives at Tony's feet, the two Manchester United players who were covering him are now out of the play and nowhere to be seen. Now, Lissandro Martinez then reacts to that and sees that he has to get across as quickly as possible. But just before he arrives there, Tony plays this really nice ball past Martinez into this space here that Mbemo can now run onto. And it becomes a foot race now between Luke Shaw and Brian Mbemo. Brian Mbemo wins the ball here. Shaw can't get it, takes one touch out of his feet and scores the goal. And we're seeing this happening a lot, this movement where the outside centre-back, the ball far centre-back has to cover for a player stepping up further up the field. And, and then this leaving a lot of space in this area here that can then get attacked by uh, an opposition player who can then score. The other example of this kind of goal was against Brighton. And in this situation, Leandro Trossard had the ball here. Danny Welbeck was here between the two centre-backs, Martinez and Maguire. Diego Dalot was over here. He was just covering the area and was gesturing for McTominay to come across. McTominay doesn't. Now there's another player here. This is Alexis McAllister, and he's making this run through this space here. And then one more player at the back, that's Pascal Gross. Now what happens is that Leandro Trossard plays this ball in here, really nice ball. Danny Welbeck is able to escape the offside track and ends up in this situation here. Now because Harry Maguire has pushed forward here, Martinez again has to pull across into this area again, and we're leaving this space open again. And because Alexis McAllister is pushing in on this line, the midfielder who is responsible for tracking this run is Fred. He should run into this area here and cover him. But instead what happens is that Luke Shaw has to track McAllister into this area so that when the ball comes across the box here, Shaw is able to stop McAllister from scoring. But the problem is, is that this leaves Pascal Gross at the back post, the ball arrives at him and he can then score. Now let's just go back and have a look at what would have happened had Fred tracked that run. So the ball ends up at the feet of Danny Welbeck, Fred tracks when Martinez comes across and then Shaw is able to cover this area now, this area at the back post where Pascal Gross is. So because Fred hasn't tracked that run, Manchester United are open, all of the defenders get pulled across by one position and Brighton are able to score. And this is gonna be an area where Casemiro is going to be able to offer a lot because Casemiro is a really good reader of the game. He's an intelligent mover. He's got really good stats when it comes to ball recoveries and interceptions. And Manchester United just needs someone who's going to sit alongside the other midfielder and help track these runs into the box. So that's an area where Casemiro is gonna start adding a lot more value to Manchester United as well. So Casemiro is going to solve some of the problems that Manchester United are facing at the moment, but not all of those problems. But Eric Ten Hag knows that those problems are mounting up and anything he can do to alleviate the pressure will be helpful. So £70 million for Casemiro is probably looking like a good shout at this point. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic brings you the best sports journalism in the world in a personalised experience, connecting you with the stories and teams that you care about the most. There's coverage of 13 sports, plus direct access to world-class journalists through live Q&As, discussions and podcasts. Not to mention, it's all ad-free. And you can try it now for free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description.